Good morning. Let's pray together. Father, at the beginning of this new year and this new semester, we ask that you would strengthen us with the assurance that our past is bathed in your pardoning grace. Our present is upheld by your strong arm and our future is secure in Christ. Strengthen us with these truths. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to block out all the noises that compete for our attention and that give us ears to hear your word. We ask that you'd speak for your children are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 52. So here we are at the beginning of a new year, and customarily, it's a time when we think about new beginnings. We take stock of our lives, we take a fresh look at ourselves, and many of us make resolutions. And we tend to start out well, but somewhere around mid-February, maybe early March, that enthusiasm fizzles out, and we tend to revert to our old patterns and habits of living. Now, Isaiah 52, our passage for this morning, is a passage about new beginnings. Now, we won't learn five steps to ensure that we keep up with our workout routine, nor will we learn three surefire ways to say no to chocolate for breakfast. Okay? Instead, we will learn about God inaugurating a new beginning for his people. You see, Isaiah 52 is a passage of comfort, and hope for a broken people. It's a passage of good news of restoration. Isaiah identifies his audience. He calls them Zion, Jerusalem, and captive daughter of Zion. And in the prophets, these words are all metonymies for God's people, the Israelites, and particularly in our passage, those who are in Babylonian exile. So Isaiah is addressing a people enslaved in Babylon who have a crisis of faith. They're wondering, where is God? Many have lost all hope and confidence that God would come to deliver them. Ezekiel, who was among the exiles, uh, cast the words of the exiles in this, par in this um, proverb. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Or the psalmist in Psalm 137, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? So it's in the midst of this sort of debilitating despair that Isaiah encourages the exilic community, don't give up hope, don't lose faith. God is about to do something new. He's about to end your period of exile and return you home to Jerusalem. So the passage starts out with the summons, the stirring summons, awake, awake. Isaiah is, is getting the people to uh, listen to what he has to say. And it's followed by six more imperatives. He tells them to clothe themselves with garments of splendor, to clothe themselves with strength, clothe themselves with garments of splendor. You may, you may remember that the exile was often portrayed as a shameful public naked stripping for the nation of Israel because they had prostituted themselves in their foreign alliances with other nations. And so here that situation will be reversed. And they're not just to put on jeans and t-shirt. The Hebrew here is clearly of royal garments, the royal garments of the priesthood. They're to shake off the dust. They're to rise up. They're to sit enthroned. They're to free themselves from the chains that are around their neck. In other words, they're to get rid of everything that reminded them of enslavement. And they're, be, they're to begin to adorn themselves and act as the people God had meant them to be. A royal priesthood reflecting his glory. All evidence of enslavement was to be removed. And the good news, no longer would any uncircumcised or unclean enter the beautiful city of Jerusalem. 
In verses 3 and 4, using the analogy of the marketplace, Israel's past history of enslavement is recounted. Egypt is mentioned, Assyria is mentioned, and the devastating assessment is that Israel went into exile without any cost. None of their captors, Egypt, Assyria, or Babylon, paid a cent to enslave them. They were in slavery because of their own sin. But they were still God's people. So the promise is that without money, you will be redeemed. Not only have God's people gone into slavery, been sold for nothing, but that wretched situation has led to an even more deplorable dilemma regarding Yahweh's reputation. You see, with wild shouts of mockery, the Babylonians continued all day long, continually praising Marduk and the patron deities for their victory over Judah. And as long as Israel remained in Babylonian captivity, Yahweh appeared impotent. And so with each exuberant taunt, Yahweh's name was dragged through the mud and shamefully blasphemed. And so he will, re he will act to resolve this theological crisis. He will restore the people, and he will clear his name. And there's not even the slightest hint of any merit on the part of the Israelites. Redemption is a work of the Lord, and the Lord alone accomplishes it. And so in verse 6, we're told that when the Lord vindicates himself by delivering his people from bondage, the result will be that they will know his name. And those of you who know Hebrew, it's the word yada. It doesn't mean to uh, intellectually think about. It means to understand the character of, to experience. And when they are redeemed, they will come to understand more who God is. And so our passage ends. But it ends on a note that it tastes like more because we know the rest of the story. A few chapters back, Isaiah named names. He said, the Lord will raise up Cyrus, the Persian king, and he will deliver the people from Babylonian captivity. And indeed, they are redeemed without money. In fact, Cyrus not only sends them home for free, he gives them all the temple treasures that Nebuchadnezzar had plundered. Our passage begs for a greater redemption. And in fact, our passage is the immediate context for the fourth and final servant song in Isaiah, which begins at the end of chapter 52. Our passage is the context for that glorious chapter in Isaiah where the profound sufferings of the servant of the Lord are described, what he will personally experience in order to accomplish our ultimate redemption from sin and death and evil. And indeed, it's a redemption accomplished without money, or as Peter puts it, without perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So here we are. We have a passage that's about new beginnings, and it's the old call of the gospel to rejoice in our redemption, to set aside the things that ensnare us, to be who we were designed to be, not in our own strength, but resourced in our union with Christ, to taste afresh and see who God is and to know that he is good. Or as Calvin put it, there's no place where we come to know the name of the Lord more gloriously than in the face of Jesus Christ, and it's because at the cross we learn of God's character. So at the beginning of this new year, let us throw off every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen.